think your technique in packaging is actually comfortable. Oh, yeah. Because I've never seen you put a plate in a plastic vessel. You always seem to use that as a way of just having some to collect the acid as you treat the acid over the Yeah, it, it, it's almost a containing thing that, that I work inside. Yeah. And, and, and a lot of that. And I work a lot under the tap. Yeah. And that sink is a very busy sink. I do all sorts of things. Like that. So you're just carrying jars like that. But a lot of the time when I'm working outdoors, I'm working on watercolors mm -hmm. and drawing in watercolors. And and in fact, that 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 book that I handed out is a is a kind of facsimile. The the Royal Academy published it last uh, last summer, and they're just reprinting it in time for this year's summer show. And we're just in the process of doing a Hebridean notebook which hopefully could be out in time for the summer next week. So you do colours watercolours? Yeah, you can so see you them in there. you white prints? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You never use colour in your prints? No. Black. Edging is the, the ultimate black and white medium. Yeah. It's a bit like, um, it's a bit like the piano. It's the ultimate black solo and black and white instrument. <laughs> and you can, and certain people can get wonderful things out of the piano. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Have you ever been influenced by someone like um, Rembrandt or you mentioned Picasso? But uh, lots of people would you say have influenced me. Picasso, uh, Rembrandt is terrific, of course, but uh, Picasso, Historic. because of his sheer inventiveness, and um, and of course Rembrandt was a great innovator. He invented new acids. That, I mean, we had a recipe at the Central School in that book of a Rembrandt's ground. He added a little bit of burgundy pitch to the hard ground, and it, so he could get the very fine needlework for those little self-portraits that he did when he was in his late twenties. And uh, and he obviously, uh, you know, before that everybody was etching rather crudely, just with nitric acid, and he invented a, an acid which mixed uh, which mixed um, hydrochloric acid with potassium chlorate salts to make a, a, it gave off a chlorine gas, and it was called Dutch Morton. And that came out at the time of Rembrandt. Rembrandt wanted to get those really fine lines. Very slow etching, but in fact very precise etching. So he was a great technical innovator with Rembrandt. A lot of people don't realise that. And so was Picasso, but it was really Picasso's assistant, Le Courier, who was the great innovator technically. But Picasso was, he, he, he was straining to get what Picasso wanted. And uh, and so this is my sugar loaf process through the pen is derived from meeting the Courier's widow and she described how she used to mix the sugar loaf for Picasso and I remember meeting her in the 70s in uh, in uh, in Montmartre. So all that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean you, I, I do have a huge library of etching books and technical books of which I've, I've read them all and uh, you. Then you pick out what you want, and then you invent new things as well. So, yeah, I mean, you take you always take a process forward into the future. Your, your film you was in <laughs> inspirational, I must say, to would-be uh, printmakers. Inspirational. So, um, any more questions? Oh yeah. I I sometimes use zinc when if I'm doing a demonstration with uh, go and do a demonstration and and actually start using. Uh, Acid. Zinc is a great teaching metal. It, it etches, you know, it etches um, uh, with weaker acids. You know, and and uh, zinc is a wonderful medium. If you etch something really subtle on zinc, though, you can't really steel face it. And so you can make a really, really beautiful uh, an etching that really works when you're only at 20 prints. A friend uses um, tin foil. Tin foil? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to learn something. <laughs> if you never stop learning, come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. I, I remember in the heyday uh, when you had your studio at Clapham Junction. Oh, God. Yes. With, with John Bell in it. Yeah. Yeah. And it was a long days there, a long time ago. You could do some very large paintings, mm. oil colour paintings. I do. I have done one or two big projects for various uh, on very large etchings, the size of this wall. For, for I, I did work a, a big thing for Lazard's Bank and, and uh, Freshfields, the solicitors, and 
and I've just done a massive one for uh, the, you know for Cambridge University. Didn't you do one that was just the, the plates? It's the, yeah, it's yeah. It's the plates, it's etching the plates right. as 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 a final mural or object in, in, in industrial stainless and things, 316 stainless. And I think various people have helped me on it. As John Duffin helped me on a big one I did for Lloyd's Bank. And uh, and Jason you know, and I, it, it tires me thinking about some things like that, a massive job. <laughs> I, so I, it's lovely then to come back to working on little copper plates, you know, that you can slip in your pocket and go and have a drink. <laughs> did your family reassess art after your great success? They How didn't did reassess they art, maybe they reassessed They no, reassess you, I mean, not art. I mean the meaning of art. Did they no, finally take My family take reassessed butchery. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. I'm sure they must be very proud of you. <laughs> Do you prefer going out when it's storming to calm, or does it not matter? Well, I'm, luckily I've got good sea legs, and, uh, and I do have one or two boatmen on the west of Ireland and the west of Scotland who will take me out in a rough sea. Uh, and it's useful for them because they've usually cancelled the, their tourist trip. So they're earning a bit of money anyway. And um, I, I had an email from uh, one of the boatmen about three days ago. There's an archaeologist who is going to, he wants to go and excavate some things on the island of Borrowry. <coughs> On uh, at St Kilda, it's, you you have got about thirty foot sheer cliff from jumping onto a rock to get up to the forty five degree. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I, I phoned him yesterday to say that I couldn't I couldn't do it. I'm a bit scared. It's a bit, it's a bit scary. But I'm I'm also doing the summer show this year, and I've got lots of things in about a week or ten days time. And they need to do it in the next few weeks. They, they've, they've proved that somebody was living on Dollary. I never thought they were. I thought they were just temporary bosses. But they found lazy beds and cultivation ridges on Dollary, which is one of the most extreme islands of the of the British Isles. It's one of the islands in the St Kilda archipelago. And uh, I would love, I would love to go up there, but uh, and. I'd, I'd have jumped at it maybe 15 years Has ago. Has the thing started? They, they, they did it, some, some research uh, last year, and uh, it's amazing that they, the, the habitations are half carved into the side of a 45 degree slope and come out. And then they've got terraces where they've got evidence of cultivating various grains and things. Of course, they had sheep on there. And the St. Kildans used to take sheep and, and of course they've got all the seabirds. And it's the biggest gametry in the world, you know, they, they, you know so baby goochers, you know, gamet eggs. What a diet. Um, have, have you ever been to the Kilwaelig um, residency? The where? The Kil Kilwaelig in Kerry. Oh, that, yeah, just inside from Ballin Skellings, inside That's from it. Waterville. Yeah. I, 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 I know all about it, and I, I, you know, and I, I, you know, I've not been there. I've been to the one up at Bally Castle in County Mayo, okay. the Ballin Glen, yeah, yeah, which is uh, run by my my dealer from Philadelphia. Okay, that that is uh, sponsored by Mary Robinson, the one That's up it. in Mayo, yeah, and it's uh, Anglo-American, oh. uh, Irish-American. Yeah, yeah. Um, Have you been to Skellig Island then? I'm going there again this summer. I've been three times to oh. Skellig and I've done lots of etchings of Skellig and I, I'm, I've just chartered a boatman who is going to take me to Skellig, Dursey, okay. the, the Bull Rock oh. and round to Mizzenhead and Sheepshead oh. and Bantry Bay. Oh, nice. And we were, we were down there not long ago, weren't we? You come from a very urban background in Leeds, mm. yet you're absolutely fascinated by the wilderness and open spaces. Is that a reaction resident. of uh, living in such an urban society? I am a resident of the British Isles. I mean, I don't get into uh, I don't get into what the Scottish independence or anything. I mean, oh, there's no, uh, you know, if I'm going to be local, I'm from Yorkshire. You know. But I I feel as if I'm a resident of, oh. of this of our you, group yeah, of Isles, and I don't you know Ireland, you know, down in Scotland, so you I know, mean, artificial borders don't really. <laughs> Any other 
sort of quick questions. I was just going to ask how you're very influential in your teaching over the years, which you don't do anymore, I don't think. But were there times in your teaching that you felt you've got something very serious back from you, or did you always felt you were giving out to students? Or how was it? I got an enormous amount back from from teaching. They, I, 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 the Central School was the greatest, the best etching studio in London, without doubt. You, you, I mean, the Slade wasn't bad and the Royal College wasn't bad, but the real skill was at the Central. And I, when I went there, I learned a hell of a lot just about the way it was run. But also the way the, the students were given the freedom to do it if they wanted to or not. And so we only got people who wanted to do it, came through that door. And a hell of a lot of people came through that door. Yes, some very fine teachers, Blair, who stands for what yeah. you know, And I was there. teaching. It was a wonderful uh, group of staff. And everybody was part-time. There wasn't a full-time member of staff at the Central when I was there. And uh, we, you know, I mean, wonderful. Blair, who stands for Gertrude, and his body flying, and Brian Wall. You know, a wonderful group of people of all ages. You know, uh, they employed me when I was 26 to teach etching, you know. Right on the shop floor, that's your class. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and you get be given a chance. I don't think that op those opportunities uh, are available now to young artists coming out of that school. I was very lucky. And then, and do you enjoy the Central? So, yeah. And no, you? Oh, yes, I'd like to say that you used the word factory about your etching studio. I remember on Monday and Tuesdays when you were in at the Central, I was a student and a technician. Mm. Um, Frank, um, the whole place had become a factory at the same time in the world. Because mm. we were actually doing all this stuff for showing the students. Mm. Um, there's a hell of a lot of students that are in the world because we were actually showing them. Um, they were, it was great did. fun, and that was great. I used to wake up on a Monday morning and, and say, ah, mon Monday, central, good. <laughs> because I knew I'd go in there and there'd be just people wanting to know. And you just go in and I'd go in and I'd work on my own books. Yeah. And, I, and we had a techni technical assistant when people had graduated with the, the two or three years technical assistant. Frank did it and he went on to run the etching at Camberwell. Charlie did it for about two or three years and then he went on and did all the etching for Patrick Proctor. Uh, Dick Tight did it and he went off and did all the etching for Tom Phillips and his, uh, <coughs> his inferno. And so the people went on and did good things. Afterwards. So uh, yep, it was a continuous, <laughs> and I was very privileged to teach with the three of us did the action there through the week, and uh, the best mezzo tinter in uh, in the country, Leonard Martian. Oh. I was I was lucky to be taught with him. We were and mm -hmm. Peter Nell, Peter Leonard and I, with our technical assistants, ran the whole show, and uh, it was great, great fun, and it was out what teaching you. The Central was a great art school. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a great, great art school. Who taught you then? I was taught by uh, Julian Trebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, Julian t was a great mentor of mine. He, he, would do, he did so much for me. Mm -hmm. And my wonderful first etching teacher called Norman Webster in Leeds, who was a classical old-fashioned etcher, but, taught, but he knew the grammar. Mm -hmm. And he taught me the grammar. He, when you've got the grammar, you can do and then I had uh, another great mentor who really took me under his wing was a man called Anthony Gross. Oh, wow. Wow, wow. And he <laughs> technically knew more about etching than anybody. He taught me all about carmine and things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, all about all those soft blacks. blacks. All those wonderful blacks. <laughs> okay. I just thought one other thing for you. It might be interesting for you. We've got lots of tools. Then uh, the Central School of Art is up for sale, I think. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Don't, no, don't tell Martins. me that. I was at St. Martin's. I'm, I'm going to buy it and open it again. Oh, there you go. <laughs> One quick question. Yeah, Norman, it's not so much a question, but are you looking for an apprentice? I'm available. Intern. An intern, yes. yeah. Norman Aykroyd, thank you so much for giving us your time and your expertise and your amazing film and just coming yourself. And having we've got a wonderful finale to our series, having you, we're very proud to have you here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you.
It's, it's I've got five minutes to, to leave here because...